morning, everyone. It's time for our Sunday morning worship service to begin. Certainly glad you're here this morning. It's always a pleasure and a spiritual benefit to assemble with God's people and worship Him in spirit and truth. This morning, we have uh, announcements before we get started. We're going to start off with the sick list. Of course, many of you know Brother Paul Lemon passed away last night about 9.15. And uh, Rick is going to be making a funeral arrangements and so forth this afternoon. I'm going to keep her in your prayers and uh, all their family as well. And her daughter Judy uh, Davis, who has been very sick, also was able to join <coughs> them and has returned home. Patricia Anderson, Ann's aunt, has been sick and is in a rehab facility in Michigan. My mother-in-law, uh, Martha Fletcher, is back at the personal care home up in Sistersville. She's doing fine. She had a little bout with a pneumonia this week. Wake Hart's here this morning, and he has testing and monthly treatment uh, that he will be engaged in soon. And uh, blood caught in his leg, he said, uh, prescribed medication for it. Danny Carpenter Sr. has continuing issues with his feet, and he is engaged in uh, receiving antibiotics and other treatments for that. He's going to have stents put in soon. Is that still going to happen? Okay. Joy Smith, a friend of Purina Mass, is dealing with liver disease and is supposed to be putting on a transplant list. Stacy White's brother in law, Roger Batten, is on hospice care with pancreatic cancer. Stacy's brother Clarence and sister in law, Trudy White, are recovering from an accident in May. Uh, Clarence's cancer has returned and spread to lymph nodes in his body. He can also break in and only have chemo since he has already had life, the lifetime max of radiation. He's also scheduled for surgery, so back surgery. Stacy White's brother Charles White is, has uh, issues with his lung, and they're going to be testing him. And Larry Conley, Roy Clark's cousin, has terminal lung cancer, and the doctors have given him uh, three months to live. His mother, Mabel, is in Ohio Valley Healthcare. Is there any other uh, announcements that need to be made concerning the sick or anything? Yes. Um, my store manager, Emmanuel Weiser, got her test results back. There's no signs of cancer. Oh, that's good. But uh, they are still trying to figure out what's going on that's uh, causing her autoimmune system to react the way it is. And then Dave will be going to Morgantown this coming Tuesday uh, to talk to some uh, doctors about post concussion uh, treatment. All right. Keep Gabe in your prayers as well as uh, Abby's prayer. No, I can't remember your name. Allie. Allie's co worker. Okay. Anything else do you want to confuse me with? That's not hard to do. Ohio Valley Youth Camp is looking for uh, donations for their uh, youth camp this year because of uh, issues with storage for uh, food. Uh, polishing a pulpit in August. Keep that in mind. Upcoming events, Love and Care Worship this afternoon at 2.30, uh, Thursday. We also have Love and Care at 7 p.m. Ladies Night Out, June 16th at 5.30 at the Western Center. And the Bible Camp is already going on. So. Anything else about announcements? This morning, the order of worship will be, Brother Mark will be leading the song service. Stacy will have the reading, uh, John 21, verses 9 through 12. Brother Mike will direct our minds to prayer. And I'll take Patrick's place at communion because he's working today. Turn it over, Brother Mark. First song will be 597. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen and be Yeah. 
Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time. Again, Father, with thanksgiving for everything which you have done for us and given us. We uh, pray, Father, that as we enter into this uh, worship service this morning, that uh, the things that's done here today will be pleasing unto you. We pray that you'd be with us here in this uh, congregation today. And not only us, but with the uh, congregations throughout the world that gather today, Father, we just pray that your uh, uh, name will be lifted up and you will be uh, honored and pleased with the church throughout the world. We pray, Father, for our country at this time, the, the people of our country. We pray that somehow us as being members of your family could go out and spread your word so that uh, the people of our country could turn to you and uh, and the uh, leaders, the elected officials of our country, we pray for those not just of our country but to the, uh, the leaders throughout the world but that uh, they could strive for peace we pray Father that uh, for the people of our community we know we see the uh, the things that goes on here and we just pray that um, the uh, people of this community would uh, we could, could uh, repent of their ways also but we also thank you father for for our congregation and the way you have blessed us and we just pray that uh, you continue blessing us we pray that you'd forgive us where we have sinned against you and just uh, 
Help us when we are faced with our temptations. Most importantly, Father, we thank you for your son and uh, the sacrifice that he made for us. We pray, Father, now that uh, we enter into this service that you'd uh, help Elvis to have the uh, memory of the words he's wanted to say today and be able to convey his message in a way that we may understand. We pray all these things to your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. Savior with you. Jesus himself instituted this memorial on the night before he was betrayed using the bread which represented his body and the blood of the tree of the vine which represented his blood. Our Heavenly Father is graciously come up with a plan for us to be with him after this life is over. He is determined to help us reach that goal of heaven. And he's so determined to do it that he took a part of himself 
made his son and gave him to us as a sacrifice for the sins that we commit because we cannot appropriately render a sacrifice for our own sins. Because our God loves us so much, he came up with a plan to get us to heaven, even though it cost him his only son. Let's remember Jesus and the spiritual benefit that we receive from assembling around his table and remembering him the way he wanted us to so that we can receive that spiritual benefit. Uh, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessed day of life that we enjoy from your loving hand. Thank you for the Savior, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your sacrifice. We ask you to be with us as we remember him. We ask you to bless this bread as we do so. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, once again we come before you thanking you and rejoicing, Heavenly Father, in remembrance of your Son and what he did for us. We ask you to be with us as we do so, Lord. Please bless us through the vine and bless us. In his name we ask it all. This will conclude the Lord's Supper. We also have the opportunity to lay by in store. And there is a basket on the back table to make that happen. So will be 593. 593. To the word, to the word, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has drawn. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do it our mind.
That's song will be number 598. All those that can and want to, let's stand for this song. As I journey here, middle toward and there's a rainbow. Six hundred and sixty-eight. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Certainly glad you're with us today. The worship is very true to us this morning. We're glad to see you. If you have your Bibles, you might want to open to John chapter twenty-one, the last chapter of the book of John. We talked a little bit last Sunday morning about the fishing trip to remember and. And the seven apostles were out there trying to catch some fish and, and unsuccessful in catching fish. And, and Jesus told them to take the net and let it out on the right side of the boat. And, and, and certainly they did that. They followed his instruction. And, and we kind of left at that point. They, they seemed to catch a whole bunch of fish. And when thinking about this, we, we noticed that, that Peter saw Jesus and he put some clothes on because he had, didn't have much on. He had his work outfit on, which, which was probably not much at all. So he put some outer garments on, swam to shore as quick as he could, and, 
And, and then as he did that, the other disciples came in a little boat. They're about 100 yards away or so, about 200 cubits uh, out into, into the area there in the Sea of Galilee fishing. And, and they brought the boat to shore. And, and as they come to shore, we see that Jesus has started a fire with coals. And on the fire with coals, he has fish laying on it. And the Bible says bread. And I don't know if the bread is on the fire or next to the fire or exactly where the bread's placed. It doesn't say. But, but the scene here is bread and fish. And it's time for breakfast. Well, we, we talk about breakfast. We Some of us might eat a, a light breakfast. Some of us might eat no breakfast at all. They say, that, they say, the health people, that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But can you imagine seeing Jesus and, and having him invite you to his setup on the shore for breakfast? I don't think anybody would say, no, I've got other things to do. It's, it's, it's Jesus, so we're, we're going to go to breakfast. It's Jesus, so no, the word no just doesn't come up in your vocabulary. It's, 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 it's Jesus, so you're going to be there. And, and so we're going to see this morning as we look at this, we're going to see this, this setting, if you will, for the breakfast table. And next week as we look at this, we're going to see the conversation breakfast because that's important too. I, I want you to notice a couple things from our first verse. Come and bring some fish that you have caught. And, and that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? We know that that, that, that Peter had, Jesus had instructed Peter to, to, to bring some fish. Now, now here's the, the issue here. On the fire, verse 9, you see 9 and 10, you see the coal fire, you see fish on the fire, and bread. Jesus is known, and we'll look at some scripture in just a moment, for being able to multiply fish, isn't he? And multiply bread. And take any amount of fish and bread and feed, as many as could ever be. So we see this weird phrase, he already has fish, it never said that Jesus went fishing. He just, the fish seemed to appear with maybe a miracle or something. And so Jesus has fish, doesn't say how many fish, but he tells them this phrase, and I really want you to notice this phrase, come and bring some fish that you have caught. That's an important phrase. Not that he had supplied, not that he had made by a miracle, not that he had done anything with come and bring fish that you have caught. Now I want you to notice why. We see that in the verse here. I didn't give it up yet in verse 9 and 10. I want you to notice why this is. If you have your, your Bibles, turn over to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. When we look at Luke chapter 5, and, and we, re, we referred to this a little bit last week, we see another story of this similar type, fishing. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 1, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gesinnereth. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. In other words, they had finished their fishing for the day, whether they caught fish that day or not. At that point, it really doesn't say, but they're cleaning their nets off and, and putting their nets away, it seems like. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Well, this was not uncommon for Jesus to go out and and in a boat or on top of a mountain or, or somewhere like this and, and teach people. Uh, Jesus seemed to, to separate himself with a little bit of distance when he would teach people. And so this was no uncommon occurrence at all. Verse 4, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out 
into the deep and lay down the nets for a catch. So he gives them specific fishing instructions here. Now I want you to know that if Jesus was talking to me, he, he, he might be giving me some good advice. Because I'm not a fisherman. You know that I'm not a fisherman. I mean, if the fish jumped in my net, I would go to grab it, and he'd probably jump out. I'm just, you know, I'm not a fisherman. But Peter is a fisherman, a fisherman by trade. He has made his living all these years by being fishing. So it's like Jesus telling a fishing expert how to fish. And so he tells them how to set out his nets, and he does it. Simon Peter answered, verse 5. Master, we toiled all night. We took nothing. So now we know that they're cleaning the nets, and now we know that they've received nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. Notice that. At your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. So the difference in these two stories is in Luke chapter 5, of course, it's a different occurrence. They've caught a large number of fish. We don't know how many, but it was so much to break these nets that they have just got done cleaning. They have fished all night and caught nothing. Of course, the best time to fish, it seems like, is in the evening and night, and they have caught nothing. Now they're just full and they're breaking. And when he had done this, or, or verse uh, 7, they singled to their partner, they singled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But, but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And so we see this scene here. It's a, 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 a typical fishing story, a fishing scene, just like we have before breakfast here. Now, the difference is we don't know exactly how many fish they took. In John 21, 20, uh, excuse me, John 21 we know that they had 153 fish. So in Luke 5, we don't know exactly how many, but we know that was enough to, for the nets to start breaking. They brought in an additional boat. They filled both boats with fish, and the boats had so much weight, they began to sink. We see so much fish. I want you to understand that. If I were to ask you the question, how much fish is that? You'd probably say, that's a lot of fish. That's a ton of fish. So much fish that, that, that you don't know what to do with it. And I want you to see what Jesus is really talking about. Because if Jesus wanted them to have fish, Jesus could have simply said, boom, there's fish. But he didn't. He made them do the physical labor to get the fish, to drop the nets, to pull the nets up, to put the fish in the boats, to bring the boat to shore. All these physical elements Jesus made them do. Now look at the next verse, the part, part we didn't read of verse 10. And Jesus said to Simon, he says Simon, Simon Peter there, just so we know, do not be afraid, for now on you will catch men. Here's Jesus' point in the whole story. Some versions will say, I will make you fishers of men. From now on, you're going to catch, you're not going to catch fish, you're going to catch men. Now we go ahead, if you will, to the 21st chapter of John, and, and we see this same setting, and Jesus is, it is, it's got the fish there, and, and, and they seem to be unsuccessful at, at, at their first attempt of fishing all night long, caught nothing. And so when that happens, we become discouraged, right? Jesus is talking about soul winning here. I want you to know that. Jesus is basically saying that the fish aren't going to jump into the nets. You're going to have to put the net out 
do the physical work, get the fish into the net, and bring the fish in. And when you do what I tell you to do, it's going to be a catch so large that the nets may not be able to hold it. I think many times in soul winning, we, we kind of think, well, we open the door and we unlock them today. We might have even put a sign out front. But if I were to ask you this morning this question, I don't want you to raise your hand, but if I were to ask you this morning a couple questions, how many of you invited someone to worship this morning? I imagine there wouldn't be very many hands up. Because what's happened is we get discouraged sometimes. We're on the wrong side of the boat, so to speak. Jesus said, listen, no, but there's no fish over there. What are you going to do? You go to the other side of the boat and you do what? You do the work. You drop your nets. Now Jesus is feeding them breakfast, and he's bringing them back to the point that he had made much earlier. He's saying, listen, you, you know, he couldn't be more clearer here if he said, I'm just going away, and you guys are in charge of the church, which will start in a few days now. And in the church, what has to happen is it doesn't matter how many fish there are in the sea, we have to catch men. You see, so you need to bring some of what you have caught. Jesus could have made fish for, for, for 5,000. There were seven men there that morning. He said, bring some of the fish that you have caught. I often wonder, will that be a question on Judgment Day? Well, how many... Times did you share the gospel? How many times did you invite someone to worship? How many times did you baptize? So, how many times did you do, do these things? How many times did you go fishing in the name of, of, of Jesus Christ? So Jesus had taken the initiative to prepare, prepare a hot breakfast for the disciples who were, were, were weary after a, a night of toiling during fishing. But we know there's evidence of Jesus feeding people. John 6, in verse 9, there was a boy, remember the boy, who had five barley loaves and two fishes. In John 6, in verse 11, Jesus took those five loaves and two fishes, and when he had given thanks, Jesus prays over them, gives them thanks over them. He distributed them to those who were seated so that the fish were so much, as much as they wanted. Imagine having five barley loaves and two fishes saying, okay, well, um, got a decent amount of bread, but still for this group, that's, eh, may, we may not have enough bread. And definitely, definitely not enough fish. Who's, who's, who's not going to eat this morning? Who's, who's, who's not hungry today? It's not like that, is it? Jesus has the ability to feed all that come, and, and he certainly does that, but he wants to, to give them a little bit of responsibility. John 21, it is all about, okay, I, I've died on the cross, I've risen from the dead, now I'm trying to show you that you have some responsibility in an upcoming church. And as we go through John 21, we see time and time again different evidences of, of that responsibility that Jesus gives them. Well, I want you to also notice the next couple of verses. Of course, John is a detailed person, and so John gives detail, 153 fish. <clears throat> Peter is sent to help pull it in, and, and, and it's not that you know, the other guys 
it seemed that maybe it's too much of a load for them, but Peter seems physically strong, so he's able to help pull it in. And maybe Jesus wanted to focus in on Peter and said, okay, Peter, he, he knew that Peter would be a pillar in the church and certainly was. You go out there, you pull these fish. I want you doing part of that. You do the work of the church. You go out and do that. So he certainly does that. And, and then when we move on to the next couple of verses, we see that they knew it was the Lord. They knew it was the Lord. And notice the verses with me. We see 12 and 13. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, like I said, just because someone invites you to breakfast doesn't mean you're going to show up, does it? We had tried to have the men's Saturday breakfast here for several years and gotten a sprinkling of men. To the point where we don't do it anymore. The ladies do a better job. They really do. They have their ladies night out once a month. And they seem to do a better job. But I think if Jesus. You know if I could tell you Jesus was going to be there Saturday. Maybe you would come. I don't know if you believe that. So it takes some motivation for us to get up and go to breakfast. Now their motivation was this. They had been working all night long. They were tired. They were hungry. There's, they can, the, the food, I'm sure the fish that Jesus already had on the fire was cooking. And, and that produced an aroma. And I'm sure they could smell that aroma. Oh, that smells good. When you smell the food and you know Jesus, come have breakfast. I'm going to come have breakfast. Now, notice this next sentence. None of his disciples dared to ask him who you are because they knew it was the Lord. There was a time before, and we'll look at that in just a second, where they didn't know exactly if it was the Lord, but Jesus came, he took the bread, he gave it to them, and also with the fish. <laughs> John 1, verse 39 said to them, come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So we see Jesus saying, come, and, and, and you will see. And so when we hear the invitation for Jesus, we, we see what we have, we have a, a several times that, the, you know, this is the third invitation recorded in John for breakfast, really. And the first one is with John the Baptist in John 1, verse 39. The second one was on the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles, or the Feast of the Tents, in John 7, verse 37. On the last day of the Feast, the great day, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. After the disciples had spent the night in their labors and fishing, Jesus' invitation to eat breakfast must have been a welcome one for them. So none of the disciples... Asked them who he was. You know, the familiar days had gone the, gone by, the days when they weren't familiar with who he was. The disciples knew that it was Jesus speaking to him, but there was something different. Perhaps the, the, the difference was displayed in, in Jesus' appearance. First resurrection appearance of Mary Magdalene, she didn't recognize him. Maybe there's something different in the appearance. Jesus' appearance to these disciples recalled the encounter with two disciples on the road to, to Aramaeus and, and, and were, were prevented from recognizing him. Luke 24 and 16, they were prevented from recognizing him. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. In verse 31, their eyes were opened after they broke bread with him and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. So after they broke bread, they recognized him. What we recognize is the Lord. Sometimes we need to stop and realize that it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's not the church's invitation, it's Jesus. The church is here to structure it, and Jesus put the church in place. But, but it's the Lord's invitation, isn't it? it it's all about Jesus. Breakfast was surpassed by the presence of Jesus for the resurrection. Assurance was provided. The 
reassurance that was provided by his resurrection. Now, now you could say, well, I'm having breakfast with Jesus, but imagine after Jesus had died and been raised from the dead, now you're having breakfast with Jesus. Now, we're going to look at what he's saying next week because there's questions to answer, isn't there? Especially with Peter. But Peter is a, 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 he's a great guy, isn't he? He said, Jesus, I, I'll go with you wherever you I'll, I'll die for you. And then, then he turns around and says, I don't know the man. So, so Jesus is going to have a couple questions for him. We'll see next week. But last thing, he's manifested. Now, this, this word manifested means revealed. If we have something underneath a cloth and and maybe we set something on the table or we put a cloth over it and you say, well, I don't know what that is. It's, there's something underneath the cloth. And then I, I, I put the cloth off and he goes, it's the birdcage. He said, wow, that helped us reveal the birdcage. Why is that there? We don't know. But it's revealed. Christ is revealed and or manifested here. And when we think about this manifestation, Jesus was now the third time. It's important to know that this was Jesus. Now, Jesus could have come back for any amount of time that he wanted to. He could have come back for one day and said, I'm, I'm ascending up into heaven, that's it. He could have come back for five days or 10 days or whatever he wanted, and he picked the, this 40-day period of time. Why? A little bit over a month. Because more people are going to see him, aren't they? The Bible tells about, oh, I, that's, is that Jesus? I was there that day that, that, that they killed him on the cross. I saw him on the cross, and now he's walking about. He must be the Son of God. This was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And the statement is, it is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples should be understood as referring to exclusively to the twelve, but not to all of them. Judas was gone, wasn't he? He had betrayed Jesus, now he was dead. Thomas was absent on one occasion. And this meal, this particular meal, only included seven of the disciples. Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene is, is not counted because it was not an appearance to the disciples. So the first appearance recorded in, in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, was on the day of his resurrection. The second... We see in chapter 20, verse 24 through 29, was one week later when Thomas, it was the episode with Thomas there, remember, touch my hands, feel my, you know, we call him doubting Thomas. So you have those appearances one week apart. Now we have this third official appearance. The important truth is Jesus was seen. He was revealed. He was manifest. Whatever word you want to put in there, Jesus was there. The Son of God had risen from the dead. As we look at some verses, to notice that this morning, we see Luke 24 and verse 34 saying, The Lord has risen indeed. We, we hang our, our hat on that, don't we? That is our belief as Christians. We believe that Jesus has raised from the dead. And if we don't, then how will we? Because our belief is that we're going to die physically unless the Lord comes. And that we're going to miss that second death because of the resurrection from the dead. Luke 12, 34, it, the Lord is risen, and he's appeared to Simon. At Acts 13, verse 31, and for many days, many days, not just one day, not just two, many days, 
he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now witnesses to this people. Jesus appeared before uh, large groups of people. You know, we have these three incidences where it's really his disciples, and because of the circle that's at the at the breakfast that morning, it's kind of like a you know a closest follower and apostle of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, and, and so we have these three appearances that really refer to that. But but there was others. There's lots of others, and for a matter of fact, we look at a verse in First Corinthians chapter fifteen that we know. And this whole chapter is talking about this belief, this resurrection, that, that Jesus is raised from the dead, and, and, and he has to be raised from the dead, and we believe he is raised from the dead. Paul would say that he was buried. Well, they, they consider buried a little bit different than we do, don't they? We consider buried that you move a, a portion of dirt put somebody down and you put dirt on top, they considered it as buried in, in, in like, a, we would call it a cave type setting. You put the body in the cave, you roll the stone, the stone would be heavy, very, very heavy. It would take two or three people normally to, to roll the stone because the stone would be so heavy. And it was that way purposely. And they had a couple of different designs. They had horizontal and vertical designs of, of doorways. And we believe that, that Jesus was in a horizontal type one. And, and that he was buried. But he had to stay there. Did he? No, he raised his, on the third day. How do we know? According to the scripture. That he appeared to Cephas. Well, that Cephas is another name for who? Simon Peter. And he's got a couple different names there. But that's Simon Peter. He, Peter we, we know he appeared to Peter, don't we? And, and then the 12, we've been talking about that, haven't we? Well, we understand that. And so if that's Jesus' inner circle, we kind of understand, okay, he appeared to his, his inner circle, and we understand that. But, but here's where things changed it. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. That's a full house, isn't it? 500 people at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So most of those 500, what would you call most? You call 450, whatever the number is. You go to 450 or more people and say, did you see Jesus? Yes. Did you see Jesus? Yes. Did you see him walking? Yes. Did you see him talking? Did you see the nails? I saw the whole thing. I saw him on the cross. I saw him in the tomb. I saw him after that. I saw him ascend to heaven, Acts chapter 1. Did you see Jesus? Yes. Then he appeared to James. This might be where James is his brother, you know. James was a non-believer for a long time, but by the time we get early into Acts, James seems to be a believer. Maybe this is what did it for James. Can you imagine having a brother, you see your brother die, then all of a sudden you see your brother, that, that would do it for me, I think. Then again to all the apostles, last of all, and last of all, I want you to notice, one born out of due time, he appeared to me also. You say, well, how did, how did that happen? You have to read another chapter in, in 2 Corinthians. You notice how that had happened. You see, it was quite a breakfast, wasn't it? You're fishing, you're catching nothing. Some man on shore sees you and says, Try again. But we're catching nothing. Try again. Move the net to the other side. Wow! There's so many fish. It's weighing down the nets. Is that Jesus? Peter, diving off, running towards, swimming towards him. The other disciples rowing up to the sea, pulling the heavy load of fish. 
fire's been prepared. By Jesus, coal fire, fish already frying up, bread for you to eat with the fish. Bring some of that fish you've caught. Me? Yeah, bring some of that fish you've caught. Bring it over here. I marvel that it never says Peter ran and it does say he ran and helped them pull the nets and it doesn't say they put any of the fish on the fire. It doesn't say they ate the fish Peter caught or anything. What a breakfast that must have been. You see, we have to realize that it is Jesus. So. It's Jesus working many times in our lives. Jesus is wanting us to follow him, isn't he? To be his apostles, to be or to be his disciples, to be the followers of Jesus. To know what it's like to be fishers of men. Many times Jesus is waiting for us. The breakfast is set. All things are ready, as the song would say. Come to the feast. You need to respond to the Lord's invitation. I encourage you as we stand. As we sing. Come to Jesus. He will save you. See everyone back this evening for evening worship. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? If you'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer. We'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this time that we've had to come together to worship you. 
We pray, Father, that the things said and done here this morning were pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father, that as we leave here, that you will be with each of us, that you'll give us safe passage to our destinations, and we pray, Father, that you will bring us all back together at the next appointed time. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Oh, hey, uh, I guess we got another birthday today. Let's all sing happy birthday to Ed. Happy birthday.